And Lauren Morelli joins me now in studio. Hi. Hi. I left a couple of details out. <laughs> and I think you've done it all. I did. I left, a, did couple, I left a couple be- of key details <laughs> out. From beginning to end. Because I figured, like, it feels funny to say you tell your story in front of you. <laughs> so can we just talk about it for a second? Let's talk about it. Okay. So because um, I, I think it gives us context for how we got here. Sure. You'd been married to a man for five months. You'd started a production on Orange is the New Black. And you remember being nervous about writing a love scene between Alex and Piper, between two women. Sure. So what what was going through your head? You know, I think at the time I had been in the writer's room and writer's rooms for television tend to be really intimate, vulnerable places. So, you know, you sit around a table with six to seven other people who, in my case, are all like way smarter than I am. And you're talking about... In the case of Orange, sexuality a lot, right? Because there are a lot of gay characters on the show and people are telling stories from their own lives. And so I had started to wonder about my own sexuality for truly the first time in my life. I was 30 years old and Mm. had just never been in an intensive environment in which people were talking really openly about their sexuality. And in on... The orange in the orange room, there was a lesbian who I looked up to. She was a brilliant writer and still is a brilliant writer and a good friend. And so I think it was the first time in my life where I was seeing really successful women who were also gay. And it was starting to see myself in them in a way that felt like, I don't understand what's happening exactly. Right. I could only imagine. Hey, so I want to play a clip just for a second. Sure. So uh, this is towards the end of the first season of Orange is the New Black. So Piper is in jail. She's on the phone with her husband, Larry. She's just told him she's in love with another woman. Mm. And he says this. I think I need some time. What does that mean? I don't know. I just, I need, I need, I need some time. Okay. I need, I need some time o- away from you. You have to let me fix this. <laughs> I don't know if you can. So that's a, that's a clip from Orange is the New Black. This is one of the more personal questions I've had to ask on the show. Okay. Did you know you were gay when you wrote that scene? Did I know I was gay when I wrote that scene? I did not. Um, I certainly was questioning it in a really intense way. And I certainly was talking to my husband about it at that point. I mean, he was my best friend, continues to be someone who I'm very close to. And so he was the first person that I went to to say, this thing is happening and and I don't know how to make sense of it. And I think both of us at the time felt like, well, we'll figure it out. You know, I thought maybe I was bi and I just hadn't realized it. And in that case, I would fall in love with someone and marry them. And I had just done that. Mm -hmm. So it felt like we would we would have a future together. Um, But certainly everything I was going through and questioning and talking about in therapy, et cetera, went into writing that clip that you just played. I mean, that's what I'm getting at here. I mean, mean, this is... This is not something I've come across before <laughs> where, you know, you are you are ha- figuring out how to have a conversation with your own husband about the fact that you're gay yeah. while writing a script yeah. about a woman <laughs> calling her husband to say that she's gay. Yeah, I think it was both a little maddening and also really cathartic at the same time. Maddening? Yeah. I, I think to have to have my whole life revolve around it, both in a fictional sense and in my real life felt I, I wasn't quite sure how to make sense of that and where I, where was I in the middle of all of that, if right. that makes sense. Yeah, like you couldn't, I mean, not that something you want to, I'm, 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 it's so challenging to use the words right here, but it's that's not right. something you could escape. Like That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So when I sit down to work and write a script, I'm dealing with it. And when I, you know, come home to my husband, I'm dealing with it. And listen, I mean, so you end up leaving your husband, you end up marrying uh, Samira Wiley, one of the stars of Orange is the New Black. Yeah. Like, Were you worried about how the cast and the crew would react to something like that? You know, I really wasn't. Um, The cast and the writers had become a real family for me. Mm. And the the set of Orange had become a place where I really came into myself. Mm. And it's funny, you know, at the time I was 30 and I felt very old, but (laughs) now I'm like, oh, I just had no idea and I was a total baby. And, um, And they really helped me come into myself. So everyone there had been so supportive of my own personal journey. Yeah. And then also my relationship with Samira eventually. Oh, man. I mean, so I'm glad I'm glad we can talk about it. When you came in, I said to you, uh, I just want to talk about the whole thing. The whole thing. And and because because you you wrote about this publicly. Right? I did. Yeah. It felt really important to me when I was going through it, when I was questioning my, my sexuality, I couldn't find anything yeah. on the Internet anyone talking about having been married to a man and coming out. And 
a lot of the narratives that I did find were about people who had known for a long time and were lying about it or people who felt like they couldn't come out. And especially with the synergy of Orange, I just felt like I had this platform that I wanted to take advantage of so that the women who came after me might have a template to look at because not being able to find my story anywhere made the whole thing so much more difficult. I felt invisible and I felt crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, I really wanted to be able to legitimize just not knowing until a little later in life for people who come after me. I'm glad you did. And one, yeah, you're right. One of my favorite parts of the uh, of the essay you wrote was like, what did you Google? Like, how do I know? Oh, truly. Like, how do you know if you're a lesbian? Like, yeah, right. I just wanted a quiz. <laughs> you're gonna find, like, you were going to find a BuzzFeed yeah, quiz. I was so dead. <laughs> I was like, you can figure out if you're Snow White or the Seven Dwarfs. Like, tell me if I'm a lesbian. Right. Yeah. So, like, tell me if I'm being a little productive here. But, like, so I'm just curious about whether you coming out had an impact on the creative project that you wanted to take on. I mean, I'm looking at Tales of the City centered around a, a queer community in San Francisco. I mean, is, did that lead you to this project? Yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, I think, again, it's maybe as a writer, there's just this mix of my life and, and what I write that ends up being not so clear cut, right? It's kind of messy. Um, but I think a lot about how few queer characters are on television still. And I wonder about the the little Lauren, who if she had had more queer people to see on television, what that would have felt like and how that might have altered my journey or yeah, not. Yeah. So I feel really passionate about getting to bring these stories to life. Well, let's let's talk about that. If you're just tuning in, uh, my guest is uh, Lauren Morelli. She's the executive producer and showrunner of a new series on the streaming platform Netflix yes. called Tales of the City, based on the classic series of novels by Armistead uh, Maupin. Um, it was serialized, right? I remember speaking to her. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, it started as a serialized. It was a daily story that he was writing, which, I mean, he talks about the deadline of that, right? Having to sit down every day and figure out what happens tomorrow. So yeah, I think we have a clip. So I had a chance to talk to Armistead Maupin in 2017. Um, I asked him to tell me a little bit more about how it all came about. I was trying to write a, a feature story about the heterosexual cruising scene down at the Marina Safeway. There was actually a ritual on Wednesday night when young men and women went down sort of overdressed and cruised the vegetable aisle. And I, I couldn't find anybody that would actually admit that they were there doing this. So I went home and I made up <laughs> a fictitious young woman named Mary Ann Singleton and gave her an experience where she, you know, fights off a bunch of jerks and finally meets the man of her dreams. And he's there with the man of his dreams. And so it, it really struck a nerve back in 1974, I guess it was, with a lot of young women in town who were who were realizing why there were so many attractive but um, unresponsive men in town. Unresponsive men in town. Um, <laughs> that is a bit of Armistead Maupin telling uh, me about the beginning of his Tales of the City uh, books. Um, how, how does it feel to hear that, knowing that you're now reimagining this? You know, it's so nice to hear Armistead's voice. Uh, he's been really involved in this version, and so getting to know him and have him as both a mentor and a collaborator has been one of the true joys of my life. He mm. just, you know, it's like everything that radiates out of his voice, his kindness and his warmth is, I think, infused in the stories of Tales and is what we're trying to carry forward. Were you, were you familiar with it before? I was not. Um, and I keep saying I feel a lot of gay shame about that because I think for a certain generation of gay person, Tales was everything. I mean, it was such a hallmark and Armistead was just so ahead of his time in terms of telling stories of gay people who were receiving love and acceptance instead of suffering. And, um, and, and so reading them at this age, getting to really dive in has been really profound because it made me realize how... Um, rare it still is, right, to find a series of books about a diverse group of gay people who mm. are just sort of living their lives. It still feels really revolutionary. Yeah, I was going to ask, why, why do we need a reimagining of this? Or why a reimagining of this in 2019, right? You know, a thing I've been thinking about a lot with Tales is often as a writer, it feels like every story has been told. And when I think about gay stories, that's not true at all. Like they're, the, the queer experience, I guess I'll call it, continues to expand and change so much. Mm -hmm. And so I found in telling these stories and, and we're kind of ushering in a new generation of characters in this version, uh, the idea of gender is expanding, our understanding of, of gender identity is expanding. And so there's just so much to talk about that I feel like genuinely hasn't been talked about before. So, so let's hear a clip from the first episode of Tales of the City. This is, and I always get this wrong, Zasha Mamed, who was in Girls, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, who plays a filmmaker in the series. She's sort of crushing on Shauna, played by Canadian Ellen Page. Hey. Hey, can you say your full name into the mic here? 
I need a record of... Do you want to tell me your name first before you start demanding things? I don't, no. Are you always this defensive? Are you always this bossy? Yes. You haven't answered either of my questions. What are you doing with that? I'm making a documentary about queer community and its disillusion as a result of the strangling grip that capitalism has on San Francisco. Do you really talk like that? Only when I'm trying to impress someone. <laughs> That's a clip from, uh, from Tales of the City. Tell me a little bit about what we just heard. Yeah, so um, they are at Anna Madrigal's 90th birthday party. Anna Madrigal's one of the original characters, played by Olympia Dukakis. Mm-hmm. And, and you're hearing their first meeting, and as you said, Sasha's a filmmaker, and Sasha's little rant there about San Francisco was our way of commenting on how much San Francisco has changed in the last 26 years since the original miniseries was made and while also kind of poking fun at the like young millennial hipster who thinks they can make a documentary and save the world. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have to mention this, like in your essay, you know, that, that you wrote about coming out, you said you, you keep on referring to yourself as feeling like a fraud, right? Mm. Feeling like a fraud while you were writing for Orange is the New Black. So like, I can't imagine what it's like to write for young queer women now in in Tales of the City now that you're out, now that you're openly gay? Yeah, it feels really healing, actually. Yeah? Um, Yeah, it does. You know, even just being in this writer's room and and leading a group of writers this time, the writer's room is made up of an entirely queer um, group of people, which is pretty amazing. And sort of stepping into, like, for so long I felt, quote-unquote, not gay enough. And stepping into, no, this is who I am, and we get to have different narratives, and my narrative doesn't make me any less valid than somebody else's narrative. Um, feels really good. No, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. Like, you, you, everyone there has their own story. Your story yeah. is maybe a little bit different than the story most people have heard. Right. But it's still, it's still valid. It's still your story. Yeah, yeah. Owning it feels good. And, and getting to tell stories of other people's narratives and allowing them to be different feels great. I'm glad you're into talking about it. I have to admit, I was a little, I was a little nervous. <laughs> you were? It. I was because... Tell these, me more. Because these are personal things. These are sure. like, I, I've never had to come out. I don't, I don't, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know the emotional um, mm. impact that has on somebody, you know? Yeah. I mean, I can empathize. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I appreciate that. You know, but I wanted to make sure, you know, I'm, I'm glad you've been so outspoken about well, it. Well, I think this is a part of progress also, right? Yeah. Is being able to talk about it and... Um, and say, like, this story actually is really beautiful instead of this is a story that w- will cloak me in shame for the rest of my life. Like, right. I'm, I'm so proud of it now. So I want to end where we started then. You talked earlier about how the writing room on Orange is the New Black helped you come into yourself as, mm. a, as a gay woman. And now you're working on this new series of Tales of the City. You also want to create a safe space, not just for people in the, in the, the writer's room, but you say for viewers as well. Yeah. What does that mean to you? I think we need safe spaces right now, and not just within the queer community. As you said, beyond that, I think we need escape, and I think we also need, I need to be reminded of our inherent kindness and goodness, and um, I believe that even though we make mistakes all the time, we're genuinely trying our best, and I really hope that this is a show that rem- that reflects that back to us as as humans. I'm glad you came in to talk about it. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for coming in. This is such a pleasure. Mm